What's up, friends? Mike Myers here with the Songwriting for Guitar podcast, episode number two, Ali Moss. Now, she's best known for being the rhythm guitarist and backup vocalist for Ingrid Michaelson for all these years, but Ali is a fantastic artist, and she's had something charted in the UK, so we talk about that. Dave Bazan, MySpace, how she stays fresh when it comes to her playing and creativity, all that and more in this episode, so let's not wait. Let's dive in. Episode number two, Ali Moss. Allie, thank you so much for doing this. I'm so pumped. I'm excited. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm a little nervous, but also excited. <laughs> <laughs> that, and you know what? That's my motto in life. Usually for life, I'm like, I'm really excited, but I'm also nervous for it. There's a good thing when they go hand in hand. That's how I feel I going on stage too, you know, like mostly excited, a tiny little bit of nervous. So it's even good. now, like after how many shows at this point have you played in your life? Like if you had to guesstimate. Oh, wow. Um, over, in the thousands. And it still feels like that when you step on stage? Well, I'll say in the middle of a tour, then it mm -hmm. becomes a little bit more secondary and normal. But I would say if it's been a while or if I'm going to do something new, then yes. And like live TV, live anything makes me the most nervous, especially live TV because it's like, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. Okay, go, 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 go. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like waiting to start a song. But thankfully, most of the time we played a you know, click track now. But there, there were a few times I was the one starting the tempo of the song. And so like that nervousness like really got me anxious. But I, I don't mind it because it usually goes away within like two minutes. Like I let it go and focus on the audience or what I'm doing. And yeah. I don't hang on to that nervousness the whole show. I don't, but yes, it still happens. It kind of, it kind of slowly passes as you're kind of going through the song and you kind of get into it. Yeah. Now, so I'm curious now when it comes to songwriting guitar, when did you first kind of approach the guitar and songwriting almost like hand in hand? They, they did come together for me and I wasn't, I was always musical. Like I grew up around in church. My babysitter when I was growing up was a singer and would sing to me. Um, but I was really more focused on sports and academics until high school I got injured. And suddenly I had all this time because I wasn't training for three hours a day. And so I picked up the guitar. I, I was borrowing one from my uncle and I knew a few chords and it was harder for me to like learn songs with this is back in the nineties. So there wasn't YouTube to like learn from. I had like one really old chord book. And so I just started writing because that felt easier than learning songs. Oh, now when you were writing songs, did you, th there's kind of a boldness too, when you start writing songs, I feel, especially at that age where it's like, you're not, were you worried about like, it's got to look like this? Or was it just kind of like, I'm just going to do this and figure it out and see what sounds right to me? It was, it was the latter. I wrote probably just really terrible songs. <laughs> I, put, <laughs> I put poems to music, you know, um, they, they were very like, I wasn't really focused on the lyrics as much as the melody and the chords. Um, so I, I wish somebody had told me sooner, like, you have a pretty voice, but your songs don't make a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's interesting. You talk about that you were concerned about the melody and the chords. Even now, do you find yourself gravitating, you know, thinking about that, you know, like the voicings that you choose, how you choose the progression is going to affect how you shape the melody? Does your mind gravitate towards that aspect of songwriting a lot? For sure, I would say that melody is a, a strength. I am don't really ever have trouble coming up with a melody. Um, and if I'm in a session and someone doesn't like that melody, I just make up another melody. Like I, I'm not really worried about running out of that. But lyrics is something I work on more as a craft. So occasionally I'll get struck with an idea that feels like it pours out of me. But more often I'm working on that part and it, and I might struggle more lyrically than melodically. Yeah. I feel the same way for a lot of lyrics. Cause it's just like, it feels like 
for every two lines that took me like several days to slowly put together. And then suddenly it's just about melodies. It's just like, oh, here's another one. Don't like it? Cool. Here's another one. Don't yes. like it? That's okay. Here's another one. Uh, I, and I'm always thinking about the voicings and like the, you know, like, you know, they're like, oh, it's this chord. And I'm like, but what if we play it here instead? I like the chords, but like. For sure. I'm not really inspired by like cowboy chords anymore is what my friend Rosie calls them. Um, is what she, she says she plays cowboy chords. Um, like they fall into songs, of course, but if I'm just strumming like open D, G, mm-hmm. and C, I, I get a little bored. I would rather start somewhere else and then realize like, oh, I can go to this open G and it sounds nice. Um, I agree with you. Yes. And is it, and it, to me, it also opens up a lot more melodic ideas in your head when you start messing around it's like you think it's this one thing but then you allow it to like actually what if i try it up here and you're like holy shit what if i do this instead and it's suddenly like it unlocks a part of your brain that you didn't know was there yeah isn't that isn't that crazy i (laughs) i just find that fascinating like um i i would rather like learn a part that has some like voice leading in it. And I think that will inspire different melodies for me than if I'm just strumming um, open chords. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I was going to say that like when I um, have been in the Ingrid band, that's always, that's expanded my chord vocabulary, chord vocabulary um, over the years because just somebody else wrote the guitar part and I have to learn it. And suddenly I have like a whole new set of shapes because um, I have to learn an Ingrid song to play it. So that's been a wonderful tool is learning other songs. Now, the question I have is, you know, did you, when you were writing songs as a teenager and like you were slowly growing with your instrument songwriting, was the prime, how did that go to you being like, primary rhythm guitarist for Ingrid Michelson. Did, did you guys know each other? Did you cross paths through that singer songwriter world? Yeah. So interestingly, I was married at the time. Um, and my ex worked in Manhattan. So we sold our home and moved to Jersey city so that I could pursue being a singer songwriter. <laughs> and I quit the band I was in and would go to open mics and, um, really this was like the beginning of a budding singer songwriter scene in new york city in the 2000s Mm -hmm. and i sort sort of simultaneously was like growing my own songs and missing being a part of something else and would just meet various singer songwriters at these open mics or and i would also go to shows like the living room and pianos and um Bar four in Brooklyn and, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on names, The Bitter End. And I basically, I met Ingrid's um, bass player, Chris Kuffner. He's still one of my besties and his wife is one one of my best friends too. And they, he carried my keyboard down a flight of stairs at this gig and he was playing bass with this other singer songwriter. And so Mm -hmm. he and I became MySpace friends. And then fast forward that to me finding Ingrid's MySpace page. This is showing my age. I was going to say, let's just enjoy that (laughs) phrase right there. It's just like. (laughs) I know. And you know what's crazy is the other day I I was going through old external hard drives and I found a picture. I took a screenshot of the first message she wrote me saying, basically, I, I, I liked her music and I had recommended her to a promoter who was putting together a show Mm -hmm. and she thanked me for doing, for recommending her. So basically over the course of a couple months, we met in real life. We heard each other play. I missed harmonizing. She was looking for someone to play rhythm guitar and harmonize with her. And I said, I would love to, but just like, don't forget. I'm still like, keep looking for someone else because I'm doing my own thing too. And you know, here we are 14 years later 
And <laughs> I said, as long as it's fun is what I told her. And she's brought that up over the years. Like, I have to make it fun because I want Allie to stay in my band. <laughs> um, but it's really just, it's, it's a related hat. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. a, it's a different hat. But when the opportunity came to tour with her, I had to make that choice. And while I really ultimately my main goal and dream was to be a singer songwriter myself and be center stage. I loved her music and I knew it was an opportunity both to grow and experience something and be a part of something amazing. And so I'm glad that I didn't let my ego stop me from being a side man um, because it's the best thing. And it ultimately did lead to more opportunities for me as a solo artist. Just right there, what you said, I feel like sometimes that's what stops, um, you know, definitely singer songwriters sometimes from good things of recognizing when like, I can't pass this up as much as I want to do this thing. This is really, yeah. really, really good. And I need to do this. Yeah. And she, at the time I also knew like, I was able to have enough self-awareness, I think, to know she was she had better songs than me at the time, and she was also a better entertainer, and that I had something to learn from both of those things. It didn't mean that I wrote terrible songs or that I wasn't a good performer. It was just I knew being around her and her band would make me better. And there were definitely moments along the way where I would walk off the same stage we could be playing as a duo and i'm playing rhythm guitar of all the songs <laughs> and singing backup on all the songs and like maybe people in the green room room would would just gush at her and i would and it, i would just like walk right past them to like you know the the table of crudite and nobody <laughs> would really say anything to me and yeah and i had to you know check my ego again and say like well that's not really why I'm doing this. Like <laughs> she, I know that I'm important to Ingrid and I, and I enjoyed this. So I don't really need the praise of random people. I don't know. And, and you know, there were times again and again, I had to check that, but I'm just so glad I did. <laughs> but that shows just your growth and your maturity as not just an artist, but as a human being and, and recognizing that, right there alone and being just as you said you know your songs as you said you know there's so much i can still learn and yeah. you know and there has to be too and i can say from you know when i started teaching guitar there were tons of genres and you know things that i didn't know because i just didn't listen to and then suddenly when i had to teach them i suddenly had all these sudden you know tricks and tools that i was adding and i was like ooh oh, I'm going to use that. So when you were, you know, learning songs for tour, did you have those moments where you're just like, ooh, I'm going to use this for my, oh. you know, like, <laughs> I love this voice. Like, I'm just going to just pack this away and just hold on to this. For sure. I mean, recently I took the chords of an Ingrid song and wrote my own song with it. I just like capoed it <laughs> and rearranged <laughs> them. Um, and her bandmate, like, what's amazing is, there were um, there are three other guitarists in the band that are all better than me, but they play like bass and electric guitar and sometimes keys. So it's like I was never if I didn't know something, there was someone in the band who could help me figure out a slightly dumbed down version until my fingers would do it. Or um, there was never any like no, looking down on me because <clears throat> just they were willing to teach and grow and like make it sound the best altogether. Um, so I was, I'm really grateful for that, but I still take lessons. Like my, my philosophy is this, like, if you look at like pro athletes, mm -hmm. the further higher they get, the better they get, they don't stop train having a trainer or a coach. They just get a better trainer or a coach. And so to me, it's like, I know I need somebody to push me. I need someone to see where am I weak and help fill in those gaps. Plus, I just really enjoy learning. And um, so I still take voice lessons. I still take guitar lessons. I'm in the same boat with you because you just 
there's never a point where you're like, ah, oh, I know it all. Exactly. Uh, I'm good. I'm great. <laughs> exactly. I'm fine. <laughs> exactly. But, yeah, I've been taking my friend. He's getting his doctorate in jazz, and I'm just like, Phew. you know, I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, can you sit down? And, and he can for hours can say things, and I'm just like. I'm just like, I don't know what you said, but it sounds really <laughs> cool and very fancy. And I need to know this. So, the, but you're right, because there's no point where you're going, especially if you want your songs to get better, you want to be, you want to have that extended range and that growth. You kind of have to, you just got to go to someone better and check your ego at the door and be like, cool, uh, yeah. what do I got to do? Yeah. And I feel like I started guitar like 15 years after all of my other friends who are professional musicians and playing guitar. Like, so I still feel like in some ways I'm playing catch up and I have, I wear a lot of hats. And so guitar is something I still feel like I'm solid rhythm player, but I'm learn I'm working on my flat picking, um, kind of readjusting how I hold the pick and my wrist even recently, which is a whole, um, feels so weird to be like, okay, got to change my form. Um, but you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> I don't know where I it, it, <laughs> No, it's just like, because there's so many little nuances, these little things that you can change. And I, mm -hmm. I can relate to feeling too. Like I was late in the, I think I, you know, my parents got me a good, I did piano for a long time. Then parents got me a guitar and then it sat there in my closet for a while. Cause I was just like, eh. and then suddenly one day, like senior year of high school, I'm like, I want to learn. Cause all my friends were in bands. They were doing these things. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, I need to start doing this thing now. Cause I need, it, cause it did feel like I need to play catch up now. Cause I'm not that good. Like I can barely hold this thing. But uh, you just I had a memory be, with the way you said that, like yeah. when I was first learning guitar, I literally was like that annoying person who brought their guitar everywhere because I'm, I can't believe I forgot this. I would bring it to school. I would bring it to F to work. If I had 15 minutes, I like found a corner and practiced. Um, it was like I was dating my instrument and, it, and couldn't be away from it. And there was this kid in school who would constantly ask me, do you know how to play this song? And I'd be like, I can play Brown Eyed Girl and that's it. <laughs> and and he would every day and I'd be like, I'm just writing my own songs. I'm working on chords, you know, but I wish I was more like that. I have, I should be, I should be more like that now, like in love with uh, it, having an so affair cool. with my daughter. <laughs> well, you know, it's just like, uh, th to me, it just means you were so you were so intrigued by it. And I yeah. think that's what's so awesome about it. You don't have to, you know, it's not the shredding. It's just like, there's something about this that like, I, it, it's maybe that was just your intuition of knowing like, I'm going to do something with it. This is going to be something that isn't going to leave my side in different forms. I'm going to be using this. And it really, it filled a gap for me with not being able to train as a, yeah. a um, I was like sad about that, you know? And so it gave me something else to focus on and I loved making something out of nothing. So I feel like I work now to be better at, at guitar so that I can accompany other people and mm -hmm. um, make more interesting guitar parts in my own songs. But ultimately I like accompanying myself in a song form. Like that's the, what the guitar does mainly for me. And that never gets old. Like writing a song is, is just like a little miracle every time it happens. <laughs> it's a it's an amazing process. And yes, you've done some amazing things with Ingrid. And you know, you you've been the rhythm guitarist, but and doing harmonies too, or playing chords. Not and that's like it's mm. multitasking to the extreme. Yes, there's there's drummers, there's bassists, there's other guitarists, but like you know, harmonizing and making sure on point all the time and, you know, playing to a click. You said, you know, being in charge of that, that's huge. Yeah. I, there are definitely songs that, um, like, um, I'm going to think of a couple, Girls Chase Boys is one mm -hmm. where my vocal part and my guitar part are like really not in <laughs> rhythm. They're like very syncopated. And that took, um, 
memorizing the vocal part till I didn't have to think about it and then using like the amazing slow downer and really slowing the whole thing down so I could do both at the same time and incrementally speeding it back up. Um, now it feels like second nature, but it when I was learning it, it felt like like rubbing my belly and patting my head. Like it, it just was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this at the same time? <laughs> Would you say it's like, you know, if you, that's interesting too, because I've heard that and I've talked to students about this, but when you have those two things that you have to do and they're just not, you know, it's brand new to just do them separately until they feel slightly instinctual, I guess. And yes. just, you know, and then eventually, even when you combine them and you feel confident in both, they're just like, whoa, they just, you know, they're slowly growing and it finally clicks. It does. It, um, muscle memory and learning kind of fascinates me. I wish I could find it. Maybe I'll find it and send you the link so you can share. There yeah. was this old radio lab about learning and how like your, your sleep, like sort of erases things that are extraneous. And that's why sometimes you can like wake up the next day and like suddenly do something that you were practicing yesterday. <laughs> um, <laughs> The other thing that ha yeah. that is a pre that is like yeah. a good motivator for me is deadlines. So, um, I, I I set deadlines for myself, and I kind of like have collaborators that I work with because that helps me stay on top of things. And knowing you have to play something in front of a big crowd <laughs> <laughs> is a really great deadline and motivator to not like want, you know, to get something done. So um, that has happened to me many times with Ingrid songs where I'm like, all right, I just like, I have a week and this has to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that to me, yeah. Just the idea of like, well, this is it. There's yeah. no like, well, maybe, I, nope, this is it. <laughs> there was one tour I played bass on because we toured as a quartet. It was like a stripped back tour. Mm -hmm. And there were like four or five songs. I was like, we really need two basses. I mean, we could use a bit low end here versus like a ukulele and acoustic guitar. So I already knew the song. So I was like, I called up our bass player, Chris, and he taught, you know, he showed me some of the bass parts and I got a bass and I was like, no problem. I'm going to do this. And she's like, the rooms are small. And the first show was like a thousand people. <laughs> and I was like, this is not small. Huh. Like, um, I mean, some of the rooms were, weren't that big in the whole tour, but I was like, whoa, to make my base debut in front of a thousand people. <laughs> it's sort of silly to me that looking back that, but <clears throat> that was also really weird because bass notes was so far from where I sing vocally. So like I had sort of like octave confusion a, a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I'm just willing to say yes to things that are a little bit outside of my comfort zone, not like impossible, but just stretch me. Um, when I played the most recent tours I did, I did toured with a guy named William Fitzsimmons oh, yeah. and he is an amazing singer songwriter, really hilarious, similar to Ingrid where his songs are really serious, but he's really funny in between songs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, William does a lot of finger picking and that was beautiful. I ended up somehow over the course of the tour playing mostly keys and um, it's just like kind of what the project needed. Um, and so like, that's an example where I'm just like, I'm not comfortable. There were times when the keyboard broke and like, I did not have enough experience to like troubleshoot it live on stage <laughs> with, you know, but we made it work and it was really fun. And I, you know, so I'm always grateful for those opportunities. Now it's, you know, you've done stuff with Ingrid, other people you've been, you know, you know, subbing in as you, and you've been playing other instruments, but with your own music, yeah. like you have, you know, a, if I'm right, Corner, that was, that was reached somewhere in the UK charts. It, it did. And it allowed me to tour, um, for like two years in the UK, That's just amazing. from it being in like a very national commercial twice. It was like everywhere. It was sort of, it was BT Infinity, which is sort of like broad. Are they like internet know. or something? Yes. 
I was like, I love the internet. Use my song. <laughs> um, and this, I didn't really know what it would do. And it was, it was really an amazing couple of years to be able to, and that's still kind of the number one song that people know and like. And that song was just a little like blip. You never know which ones people are going to connect to or why. And, and sometimes, you know, especially in sync licensing, which ones they're going to use. Yeah. And you're just like, okay, I, all right, here we go. Um, and like, you know, you've had other songs and shows and you've, you've released music. You just released a single um, back in June. Yeah. Too. That was a cover um, of The Cars, 1984 hit. You might think. I don't know if you've heard that. If you've heard that recently, I, I, it's been a while since I've heard it. But your version, and especially too, there was a um, e- collaboration you did um, back in 2016, which had a, a, a cover of Dave Bazan's "Hard to Be," which I love. Yes, uh, he's my favorite. Can we gush about him for a second? Can, can we gush about Dave Bazan? Absolutely. I, you know, Pedro <laughs> the Lion and just yeah. his solo work. He's fantastic. He's one. He's probably like the artist I've seen the most live out of any artist. I've seen him full band, acoustic. I've seen him house concerts. I've driven hours to see him play. Probably 15 or 16 times I've seen him. And there's just something in his voice and in his writing. And again, in those, in his chords, like he can take a song that like, works on electric guitar with a full band and then also play it like on a, uh, you know, like a little Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he has this tiny, li- tiny little Martin that he plays in house shows. <laughs> yes. And it just is like the way he voices the chords and his changes is just really in- moves me. Um, and I love he, I love him and I love that song. And um, I was glad the girls were down to cover it. He did like it on Instagram. So I, I definitely have a screenshot. (laughs) (laughs) I keep that too, because Mm -hmm. yeah, that's to me right there, how you were describing how we were just talking a while ago about like, Oh, they matter. But the things that you're talking about, like the voicings they chooses and how it speaks and how it blends with his, his voice and his lyric that they all matter. And it's yeah. just like, you know, when people talk about like oh, chords, you know, oh, the chords are okay. The melody and the lyrics matter. And it's like, yeah, but the voicings you choose too. Yeah. And um, Bess Rogers, who is one of the girls in that band, and she's like one of my main writing partners. Mm-hmm. Um, she's a really good guitarist. And so I feel like I'm always learning from her and she'll always help me make something a little bit more colorful, I like to call it. Um, and so, yeah, my number one tip for anyone listening that wants to get better is find someone around you that's better than you on the guitar (laughs) and just, you know, glean. (laughs) But that, that is wonderful. I mean, because I think hearing from, you know, people can look at what you've done and just be like, damn, but you're the, the, you are by far so grounded in your perspective, just saying, leave the ego at the door, learn from someone better, go away, do it, write some songs, then cool, go find someone that's better. <laughs> and yeah. it's just like, it's, it's, and it's so cool because there's not a process where you say it's done. It's just, it just keeps going. Yeah. I, I get, maybe it's because I get bored easily. <laughs> maybe it's because I'm a, a perfectionist and I really like to just get better. I I don't like to settle. Um, But I feel like I'm in a healthy place with that. In years past, I would be probably on the negative side, like um, not as healthy in terms of like my self-esteem or my self-worth. And um, so I think it's good to be able to assess yourself and look at your strengths and weaknesses but not, but in a healthy and loving way, <laughs> kind to yourself way, be kind to yourself the way somebody you'd be kind to someone else, you know, that's yeah. taken me a long time to get to that place where, um, I don't, you know, think like, ugh, I suck. And, um, and 
in a good way, you know, <laughs> I say this without it coming off like she doesn't care. Ingrid is really great at like the heart of her show is to like entertain mm-hmm. and connect with an audience. So she didn't care if I hit wrong chords. She ha- she would care if I hit wrong chords and then she looked over at me and I was like sulking about it. Like, so over the years of touring with her, it was just like, oh, okay, like mistakes are fine as long as they're like passing things. Like everyone's a human on this stage, like, but keep your energy up and, and don't let it like – bring the whole rest of the show down if you if you messed up one little thing you know and i think singer songwriters and you know especially in guitar when the, it's that instrument are so good at beating themselves up <laughs> and just being like ah oh, that was shitty i'm terrible i'm the worst yeah. and it's just like those phrases and like sometimes if i'm singing with a student or a client and i'm talking i'm like the first thing you've got to change is how you talk about yourself because I'll yeah. hear them describe technique and things. And they'll be like, I'm awful. I'm not really a guitar. And I'm like, right there. Until yeah. we change the language and how you talk about yourself, only then, then we'll get into the technique stuff. I'd rather spend way more time about how you're talking about your creativity, your, your ability, than actually delving into technical because that needs to change. Before you it learn. really is. I agree with you a thousand percent. Like that's my own experience is like I enjoy creating more now that I am not as into beating myself up and I let things go. And it doesn't mean I'm not, a, you know, like working to get better or that I don't want to be excellent at, <laughs> at everything I do. But it means like if I I admit that I'm human, you know, and um, I, I agree with you that that fears and and how we talk to ourselves can hold us back more than our lack of like technical skill or understanding more often. It's like you're human and you can enjoy the journey and the progress of you getting better. It doesn't have to be this, I don't know, Elizabeth Gilbert talks about like, you don't have to suffer for your work, your creativity. You don't have to sit there and beat yourself up. Like a architect is not sitting there beating himself up and being like, I need to add more windows. Damn it. And it's just like, he's enjoying (laughs) the process of creating. Yes. And why can't it be the same for an artist to enjoy that process as well? Yeah. And in case there's anyone out there like, me, (laughs) which I think there probably is. Um, I would say that like my biggest block was actually getting started most of the time because my standards were so high and I wanted to be good that like I would edit myself before I even let myself write anything. And that would be my, my, you know, on like a practical level, my number one piece of advice is just make more stuff and you can do it in a timed way or in – there's lots of ways you can, like, make it a game or take yourself – yourself as the artist out of it to just practice writing and not judging it. Like, not even have having t- – giving yourself time to edit something. Like, go for writing the most songs you can. <laughs> and that has really helped me um, because I, like it, – it got, get over that block of, like, not even being able to create because I am stopping myself before I start. If you made that like a bulletin in MySpace back in the day, I would have messaged you and been like, yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because all of those things, I completely agree. I think people think of the finished product or this perfect product in their head. And when they start playing, they're like, it's not it. It's Mm -hmm. not it. They don't even begin because they think everything they do is awful and it needs to be perfection. And it's like, no, you've got to just jump in and start. Yeah. There's this Ira Glass quote. I forget where it was from, but he talks about how like usually when you start making something, I think he was referring to people in like radio and stuff, but your taste level is like way higher than your skill and your experience. And you just have to get through that period of like making things that aren't as good as you want them to be and knowing that that's okay. So I am okay with having bad ideas and writing bad songs basically 
<laughs> the ability, <laughs> the fact that I can say that is like the perfectionist that I am, like that, that's the biggest thing that's changed for me is that I, it's like, okay, if I'm writing a lot and I, today I write a bad song, then it's fine. Tomorrow I'm just going to write something else, you know, start another idea. And well, I can say you're more than okay, but de- <laughs> well, absolutely. And just, I put out the songs that I like <laughs> though. <laughs> that's the key. I write other ones that aren't as good. But also to your transparency in the process and being and sharing, I think is something that's going to be refreshing for people to hear, to be like, I thought I was the only one thinking this. Yeah. And to hear you from what you do and the place where you're coming from, I think is exactly what people need to hear. And just you taking the time. I absolutely appreciate it because this was wonderful. And I'd love to have you back one day and we'll just talk more guitar and more about process. I would love that. Thank you so much. Uh, That conversation was just so good because Allie was beyond the sweetest. I could have kept on talking to her. I hope to have her back because it was just so much fun for me. And one thing that we talked about that was super important was always looking for someone better. Someone that you can go to, that you can learn from. I feel the same way she does. So you hear that from people that are doing so many kick-ass things. How did you get here? They seek out people that are better. They spend time with them, learn from them, and put it into practice. This week, I'm super excited to offer a free series on how to write with an artist via Zoom. Right now, a lot of people are trying to go towards co-writing via online, and there's a lot of unknowns. A lot of people want to understand how to write for artists. So my good friend, Maddie Finn, who is a freaking successful artist, who is so good. She is only 24, but she's insanely talented, but the most grounded, sweetest person you'll ever meet. We sit down and we write a song from scratch. So it's a three-part video series on the do's and don'ts of co-writing. You see us write a song, and we talk about things that made that co-write good, but some things that could have made that co-write totally toxic and just unproductive. So it's a free video series. If you just go to songwritingforguitar.com slash how to write with an artist, you can walk through that free video series, take notes, learn from it, and start to put it into practice. Because you know what? You're capable of writing kick-ass songs. And that does it for this week's episode. It was edited and produced by the amazing Chris Fafalius. I'm Mike Myers. Until next time.